Coming to you from an abandoned mall. The horror. <laughs> it's the little podcast of horrors with James, Christina, and Chris. Greetings and welcome to episode 16. I am Chris. I'm James. I'm Christina. Oh, you just belted it out right there really quick this time. Yeah. <laughs> You never know what you're going to get with this guy. Yeah, he's always switching it up. He's a wild card. He is a wild card, but I like that I'm about a him. Wild card. He's a wild man. <laughs> he likes to get crazy and and and, and just fun. So, ah, <sighs> man, sixteen. We've done sixteen. Ep- this is going to be the sixteenth episode. How about that? Our sweet sixteen. Woo-hoo. Sweet Aww. sixteen. <laughs> I want a pony. <laughs> Yeah. No, we can get a car now. Oh my gosh, yeah, we can get a car yeah. now. Yeah. The beat up hand me down. That's car. right. That's what every 16 <laughs> year old should get. I used to be so pissed. Those people were like, my mom and dad, they bought me a brand new Mustang. What did you get? I got a 91 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. <laughs> like, and you know what? I loved that Cutlass Supreme. That was my and first they, car. They don't make Cutlass Supremes anymore. No. No, they didn't. Aww. Or cutlasses. No. That was my first car. And I loved it. So screw screw you, Tad, and your freaking Mustang. Yeah, Tad. A what? Tad much. Yeah. A little Tad overzealous. I don't know. Anyway. Well, today <laughs> I'm gonna be doing the episode finally. It feels like I've been kind of in the background for a while. I'm sorry about that. I mean, these two have just been leading the way with their crazy amazing stories of time travel and monsters and other stuff cults you don't need crazy stories to shine chris yeah every every episode (laughs) so damn sweet i love this girl man okay well this is going to be my first episode where i actually talk about my own unsolved mystery which actually goes into one of the biggest not one of the biggest but A well-known conspiracy. Um, And with that said, today I will be discussing the unsolved murder of a former lover of President John F. Kennedy. Who you may remember. Did you kill JFK? Did what? Did you kill JFK? That'd be a little hard. Is that what you're about to tell us? That'd be a little (laughs) hard, man. It was 63 and I was born in 79. Do the math. How many times have we talked about time travel already? Well, I have (laughs) not been able. Oh, that's not possible. I have not been able to What show are you on? Whoa, hold up. I have never said that is not possible. In fact, I was the first one to be into time travel before anybody else in this group. (laughs) Don't you even. Don't you dare. No. But if I could time travel, I'm not going to go back and like kill somebody, especially the president, man. I mean, I might go back to that day to You're find out what a really story. I'm just trying to. to hey, man, to put if I'm going to go back in time, I'm going to go back and find out what actually happened. So. I mean, just saying. So, so you didn't kill JFK? No. That's all I was asking. I didn't. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> all you yes had to say no. was no. <laughs> no. Yes or no. But no. Yeah. No. <laughs> did you? No. Okay, yeah. then. Good. We, Christina, did you? No comment. Oh, wow. <laughs> the plot thickens. <laughs> I don't want to t- try to do all the work to time travel just to get merged into somebody's wall. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I don't blame you there. That was really a fumbled assassination attempt. <laughs> Half for your reals. body's like stuck in the wall. <laughs> yeah, for real. Damn it. Hey, could you come a little closer to this wall? Jesus. Oh, my God. Anyway, so we're going to be discussing the unsolved murder of a former lover of the president's. And I'm not talking about maybe Marilyn Marilyn Monroe. Monroe. No, I'm not talking about Marilyn Monroe. No, we're going to be discussing someone you've probably never heard of. And her name was Mary Pinchot Meyer. Oh, yeah. And she was murdered with a single gunshot to the head on October the 12th, 
1964, in a park while taking an afternoon walk along the Georgetown tow- towpath in Washington, D.C. So, hey, and, but, like broad daylight? Yeah, broad, <laughs> no, yeah, like, yeah she was murdered in broad daylight. That's how, yeah. Wow. So how is this personal to you? Did you know the killer? Are you related to the killer? Who said it was personal to me? You <laughs> said at the opening that you're going to share... <laughs> His story. own unsolved. Yeah, your own unsolved or something. Mystery. Well, it's. Uh... <laughs> did you do it? Did you, did you kill her? Did you time travel and kill her? No. Take... Chris is like, this is my last story. I am not yeah. doing. Yeah, this I'm again. out. <laughs> you little banter fish. What did you guys call it? What is it? Hecklefish. You little hecklefish. <laughs> God, no! I have never murdered anybody, and I never will. I'm a pacifist. I'm gentle. I'm a I'm a peacemaker, man. Gosh. <sighs> anyway, so before I uh, and before I go on, let me just cite my sources. I used an article that was written in People Magazine, and then Wikipedia. So, anyway. Okay. And forgive me how I sound. I'm getting over a, a chest cold. So, the one nice thing is, gives me that deep voice. Hello oh my there. goodness. <laughs> Welcome to Little Podcast of Horrors. How you guys doing today? We'll be I, taking a break from horror to talk about some romance. We'll stories. be talking. Yeah, yeah we'll be talking. Up. We'll be talking about them <laughs> horror stories. Oh yeah. <laughs> we got a whole crop of new followers. <laughs> They're like, uh, uh, follow. Hello. <laughs> That's right. Step right in, baby. It's gonna be really <laughs> hot and spicy today. You that actually shut. is really good chris <laughs> <laughs> i know it's like i'm laying in bed and i was like like hello there and i was like wow that's that's actually pretty cool yeah i feel all funny inside what <laughs> i think uh-huh. so, anyway anyway to uh, so give a backstory uh meyer actually met kennedy before he was even elected president, um, they met. You usually, he, have to meet him to fall in love. That's true. That's true. What I mean is, she met him before he she he was even the president. Uh, okay. Like they went way back. Like she met him before he met Jackie. In fact, they met at a prep school. Oh dance, wow! Uh, when they were just teenagers. Oh. Yeah, they they oh, went way that's back. Cute. Yeah, and it's this gets kind of interesting. You know, you guys talked about rabbit holes and falling down. I fell down one with this even more than I expected. Um, mm-hmm. The the affair itself is actually to believe to have started years later um, after they were both married to other people, Kennedy to Jackie, of course, and then Meyer to her then husband, uh, Cord Meyer, who was a high-ranking CIA official. The two couples actually lived next door to each other prior to the 1960 presidential election when Kennedy was just a senator. Not only that, but Meyer's sister actually married the Washington Post editor, Ben Bradley, who was one of JFK's closest confidants. So they were like just all intertwined with each other. Um, So (laughs) intertwined, intertwined, intertwined. That's right. Intertwined with the core. Yeah. Um, Man, I'm going to be sad when this is gone and I'm just back to. Hello there. Hi, I'm, I'm my, higher, my higher boy. I'm Chris. Hi, guys. Hi. Hey, guys. You guys want to come over and check out my, my new computer setup? It's amazing. Yeah, so. Anyway. That's how so. we should do the romance episode. That's right. <laughs> and so she stroked his face with her soft hands. Oh. It was so scrumptious and Oh my god! Oh, now I'm giving myself the heebie-jeebies. I gotta stop. You're spitting um, all over everybody. I know. It's like they're like, Chris. Good lord! And <laughs> we just lost all those new listeners. And they're all gone now. <laughs> Even Heather is unsubscribed. <laughs> she's like, I am not following this anymore. No, she's in the No, she, 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 she's been. Mm-mm. She, she knew. <laughs> she's known for two decades. She's in. She's not going anywhere, and she knows it. So she cannot escape. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. So it is believed the affair could have started sooner, but the reason that they feel it started, uh, they believe it started during the actual presidency because Meyer's name is in several White House logs starting in October of 1962. And coincidentally, this is often when Jackie was away. 
Oh. For, yeah. Further cementing this was you. when Meyer's diary was discovered describing the affair. However, this cannot be further oh. explored because the diary was actually burned later on by Mary's sister, Tony. Oh, man. And you, you're here you are with the voice to read the diary. I know, right? But the president lured me into the Oval Office. No. Uh, this, is all, <laughs> <laughs> this is all documented in an autobiography actually written by Bradley in 1996 entitled A Good Life. In the book, Bradley said that the chief of the CIA counterintelligence, James Angleton, actually broke into Meyer's studio to find the diary the night Meyer was murdered. And Bradley oh, actually, shit. and he Bradley actually caught him in the act as the studio was attached to Bradley's house. Angleton claimed that it was his concern for JFK's reputation that led him to search for the diary and that he intended to destroy it. So Bradley let him take the diary. However, sometime later, Bradley discovered that Angleton had not destroyed it and, in fact, preserved it. Because of this, Bradley took it back, and that is when his wife, Mary's sister, destroyed it. Now, Mary was known as a free thinker and someone who experimented with LSD and pot. Now, this is where things start getting kind of interesting. In April of 62, Mary visited Timothy Leary. He was a former, he's a former Harvard University psychology lecturer who later claimed in his 1983 autobiography, Flashbacks, not, not to be you know, confused with Flashdance, uh, that <laughs> Meyer had, had asked him to teach her how to run an LSD session. Le- Leary said that Mary, cool. told, Mary told him that she had a friend who was a very important man and that this friend was impressed by what she had told him about her own LSD experiences and that he wanted to try it. So this would, if I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken, this would be during the era that the CIA is screwing around with LSD for like MK Ultra stuff. Yes. And yeah. yes. And Leary later came to believe this friend was in fact President Kennedy. Um, she believed, Mary believed, that if powerful men took the took LSD, they would have revelations that would lead to ending world conflict. And it's because of this that Leary believes um it, it that so, Leary believes this influenced so, Kennedy's views on nuclear disarmament and oh. reapproachment with Cuba. So, um, so basically, it did their whole theory is like, well, if we just get a high on drugs, we'd be like, hey, man. Well, yeah, that's what basically they're saying. How like, about let's just not fight anymore? That pretty much. Well, you can you can have like transcendental experiences mm. under yeah. drugs like these. So yeah, it and makes Mary, sense to yes. me. I love her for this. Yeah, <laughs> I really Mary, love this woman. Mary actually believed, yeah, that you know this that LSD LSD experiences could lead you know world leaders to peace. Mm-hmm. Um, and Kennedy's aide, uh, a Meyer uh, Feldman, said, "I think he might have thought more of her than some of the other women and discussed things that were on his mind, not just social gossip." Um. Mary might have actually been a force for peace during some of the most frightening years of the Cold War. Yeah, so. Oh. Yeah. And people who have investigated the affair have come to believe that JFK and Mary had an intellectual kinship. Um, Mm -hmm. Charles Bartlett, who I mentioned earlier, uh, emphasized the serious nature of of, uh, Mary's romance with the late president in an interview for a book about Mary entitled Mary's Mosaic, which was written written by a Peter Janey, if I said that right. And it stated that was the dangerous relationship. Jack was in love with Mary Meyer. He was certainly smitten with her. He was heavily smitten. He was very frank with me about it. Uh, so yeah, Pinchot, uh, Mary Mary uh, was a guest at the inti- at an at the intimate party hosted by Jacqueline Kennedy in honor of President Kennedy aboard the yacht Sequoia on his forty sixth birthday which is his which was his last in may on may 29th 1963 kennedy would later be assassinated that november so yeah and in fact a month prior to that in october of 63 kennedy wrote a letter to mary employing her to join him for a tryst the unsent letter written on white house stationery and retained by kennedy's personal secretary Evelyn, Evelyn Lincoln sold in June of 2016 at auction for just under $89,000. The letter reads, here we go. Why don't you leave suburbia for once? Come and see me either here 
or at the Cape next week or in Boston in the 19th. I know it's unwise, irrational, and that you may hate it. On the other hand, you may not, and I will love it. You say that it's good for me not to get what I want after all these years. You should give me a more loving answer than that. Why don't you just say yes? And it's a pity <laughs> people don't say tryst anymore. I know. That's right? a word that needs to come back. Yeah. And he signed the letter. Yeah. So. Oh. Which to me, that sounds a lot sexier than why don't you leave suburbia for one? Come and see me <laughs> here or at the Cape next week or in we'll Boston. Have some clam, we'll I know have some clam chowder. We'll have some clam chowder. Ask not what I can do for you, but what you can do for me. Oh my God. Hugs and kisses. Jack. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so. <laughs> but basically, their relationship was quite intimate. And many people believed that she had influence on him. And of course, the conspir- one of the conspiracies is, is that's why he was assassinated was because he wanted to pull us out of, you know, out of the Cold yeah. War. He wanted to pull us out of Vietnam. So mm-hmm. and the theory goes is that they blamed her. And the worst part was they were also worried about what she knew. So so now we so, jump. Oh, go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Nope. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're gonna, gonna answer say, my question. I say now we get to the murder mm-hmm. on October the 12th, 1964. Now, um, this is when the, the, this occurred just after the Warren Commission had completed over okay. whether or not uh, Oswald had acted alone. So mm-hmm. um, I think it was just a month later um, after that. I have to check my notes here. But on October the 12th, 1964, uh, Mary had just finished painting and went for her customary daily walk along the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal towpath in Georgetown. Mechanic Henry Wiggins, it's Mr. Wiggins, was trying to (laughs) fix a car on Canal Road and heard a woman cry out, someone help me, someone help me. Oh. Yeah. Wiggins heard two gunshots and ran to a low wall looking upon the path where he saw a black man in a light jacket, dark slacks, and a dark cap standing over the body of a white woman. That's the quote, as as he put it. Mary's body had two bullet wounds, one in the left temple and one in the back. An FBI forensics expert testified at trial that dark halos on the skin around both entry wounds suggested they had been fired at close range, possibly point blank. The precision, placement, and instantaneous lethality Lethality, is that right? Lethality? Yes. Of, of the wounds suggested to the District of Columbia Medical Examiner that the killer was highly trained in the use of firearms. Mm-hmm. So, approximately 40 minutes after the murder, Washington, D.C. police detective John Warner spotted a soaking wet African-American man named Ray Crump about a quarter of a mile from the murder scene. Crump wasn't running. He was walking. Detective Warner testified at the murder trial. Crump was arrested at 1.15 p.m. near the murder scene based on the car mechanic Wiggins' statement to police that Crump was the man he had seen standing over the victim's body, as well as Crump's inability to give police a coherent explanation for his presence in the area. The day after the murder, a second witness, Army Lieutenant William L. Mitchell, came forward and told police that when jogging on the towpath, The preceding day, he had seen a black man trailing a white woman he believed was Mary Meyer. Mitchell's description of the man's clothing was similar to the clothing Crump had been wearing that day. On the strength of the statement of these two witnesses, Crump was indicted without a preliminary hearing. No gun was found, however, and Crump was never linked to any gun of that type used to murder Mary Meyer. Oh, well, that's just any given arrest nowadays. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So oh, yeah. he's just the fall guy here. Right. <laughs> yeah. And he may have, he may well have been. I mean, there's, there's no telling. 
Well, that's um, how the CIA did Lee Harvey Oswald, right? He was he was a patsy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. It, it there it was like it was in abundance patsies during this time because you had like JFK's mm-hmm. murder and then later, you know, Robert Kennedy's murder with yep. Sirhan Sirhan and there were now Sirhan yep. Sirhan, I mean, he did it. He was holding the gun. Like there's no yeah. ifs ands or buts about that, but there were theories about him that he was hypnotized because he claims to this day, if I recall, that he has no memory of doing it, nor he has any idea why he did it. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I don't know. But he done got oh, MK Ultra. Yeah, he did. And you know what? I saw something that linked uh, him with the Rosicrucian Order. <laughs> oh my gosh! Really? They're, they're they are touching everything. <laughs> That's oh my gosh. Okay. Anyway, um, where was I? You were at cops arrested a black guy because he scared a white woman, and there is no gun. Mm-hmm. And now here we are. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. And I would. I wish I could say there was more to that, but there isn't. Um, he was acquitted because uh, there was not not enough evidence. Oh, the e- okay. Well, the evidence the evidence against him was strong. They said, but it was circumstantial because there was no gun found. And right. Oh, oh. And eyewitness testimony is notoriously unreliable. <laughs> yes, it is also very unreliable. Um, but those investigating it, I mean, um, several of them believe that Crump was entirely capable of violent behavior. And some of them even believe without a doubt that he is actually the one that killed her. But it is still considered an unsolved mar- murder to this day. Does he have like a military background or anything? Because they said he was, it, it would have been someone really skilled, right? Exactly. Um, but not that I could find. Uh, that would require me to do some more digging. Um, His resume is that a white woman was scared of him. Uh, um, Crump came to trial in 1965. Judge Howard Corcoran ruled Mary Myers' private life could not be disclosed in the courtroom. Myers' bra- background was also kept from... Uh, from Dovey Johnson Roundtree, Crump's lawyer, who later recalled she could not find out almost anything about the murder victim. It was as if she existed only on the towpath on the day she was murdered. At the trial, what? Roundtree demonstrated the uh, the coarseness of the police dragnet and showed that Ray Crump was 50 pounds lighter and five inches shorter than the five foot, eight inch, 185 pound male that Henry Wiggins had described to police. Although okay, Lieutenant Henry William, Wiggins, yeah, uh, every time I hear Wiggins, I'm just like, ah, I don't but, guess so. What's yeah, I was his thinking background? The whole time, is his first name Ralph? I know, no, or it's it's Chief Wiggins. I prefer well, Ralph. Well, what's his background here? He's the only one that witnessed. Yeah, the first witness was mechanic Henry Wiggins, W I G G I N S, mm-hmm. who was he says he was trying to fix a car on Canal Road and heard a woman cry out. And he um, was the only one that saw it that day, but then another person came forward, right? Correct. The day the after the murder, yeah, the day after the murder, a second witness, Army Lieutenant William L. Mitchell, came forward and told police that when jogging on the towpath that, that the preceding day, he had seen a black man mm. trailing a white woman he believed was Mary Meyer. Mitchell's no. description of the man's <laughs> clothing was similar. He didn't claim to have witnessed the murder. He claimed to witness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Know, very yeah. convenient to remember something like that. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Very like, suspicious, you being yeah. nearby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and just you know, happened to remember this lady being followed. Like, you didn't think that much about it before, but yeah, you remember real. it now. But by okay. being followed, I mean, he was mm-hmm. nearby. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> Exactly. Yes, exactly, James. But it's 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 Lieutenant Mitchell who estimated the height of the man, and he claimed to have seen that he had cl- claimed to have seen trailing Mary, um, but it mm-hmm. didn't add up because it doesn't match Ray Crump's height. And right. Weight. Okay. And so because of this, Crump was acquitted of all charges on July the 29th, nineteen sixty five, and the murder remains unsolved. So, our um, oh. author Nina Burley has argued that Crump's post-trial criminal history indicates his capacity to murder Meyer. Defense attorney Roundtree, however, attributed Crump's post-trial violence uh, to the trauma he suffered during his eight-month imprisonment while he awaited trial for the murder. 
So sure. Yeah. Yeah. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, in, in Bradley's a good life, um, Bradley actually said in the book that despite Raymond Crump's acquittal on all charges immediately thereafter, district of Columbia police physically escorted him to the border of the district of Columbia and Virginia. It was basically like, get out. Wow. Like, even after he was acquitted. Classy. Police yeah. told him never to set foot in the district of Columbia again. Yeah. And Crump was the father of six underage children who oh. lived in the district of Columbia. <gasps> so. Man, the CIA is just choosing all these patsies, these poor people. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So you heard me, CIA. Yeah. <laughs> So a few mm-hmm. allegations that have come out since then. Um, in March of 76, the National Enquirer, there's a there's a trustworthy source. Trustworthy there was source. One. Could, yeah. Quoted James Truitt <laughs> as stating Meyer had a two year affair with John F. Kennedy and that they smoked marijuana in the White House bedroom. And according to Truitt, their first rendezvous occurred after Myra was chauffeured to the White House in a limousine driven by Secret Service agents where she was met by Kennedy and taken to the bedroom. He stated that Meyer and Kennedy regularly met in, the, in this manner, sometimes two or three times a week until his assassination. Truett said the two would usually have drinks or dinner alone or sometimes with one of his aides and claimed that Meyer offered marijuana cigarettes to Kennedy After one such meeting on April 16th, 1962, he said that after they smoked three joints, uh, she commented, this isn't like cocaine. I'll get you some of that. According to the Inquirer, (laughs) Meyer also kept, yeah, kept the diary of the affair, uh, as I mentioned before. So I wonder what JFK was like high. I don't know. Oh, and 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 James, just to explain, James Truett was an American journalist who worked for Life and Time magazine, um, and he was later the vice president of Newsweek mag- magazine. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, John F. Kennedy High. I don't know. He'd just be like, whoa, I just dropped this feather. Watch as it floats through the air, <laughs> much like we do through life. Are we the feather? Are we the feather, Mary? I don't know. Sorry, I'm trying to get the name of that documentary that I just watched. Okay, that documentary that I was telling you guys about that I just watched is JFK Revisited Through the Looking Glass. I think that was it. And it's about basically, you know, the likelihood of the CIA having been the perpetrators of that assassination. Oh, okay. Um, Anyway, to conclude this story, um, just to get to the end of this, um, much like that of her presidential lover, the mystery surrounding her death lives on, as does her legacy. I was told in the last few days of her life, she told friends that she thought people were breaking into her house, rifling through her things, says Burley. I'm not sure she ever said she was afraid for her life. She was a bold and fearless sort of woman. So before her death, People were, you know, she had claimed that people were breaking into her house and rifling through mm-hmm. her things. And like I said, this is just after the Warren Commission had concluded. Yeah. It's like, almost like it was things being, loose ends being tied up. Once. Yep. Because it's like, you know, once the Warren Commission's done and they're saying, nope, there was no conspiracy. It was just Oswald. And it's like, okay, now mm-hmm. we can take care of this and nobody will say anything but of course you know just another piece of evidence to suppress yeah but to this day her murder remains unsolved i'm sorry mary me too yeah i mean from what i've read it's like man she was trying to you know like if it's true if all of those things are true or even some of them are true it's like she was just trying to bring about peace she wanted us to stop doing war and i mean I mean, granted, she was, you know, having an affair with a married man, you know, who was the president, but I don't know. Whatever. You got to make some sacrifices for world peace. I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Christina's wondering, or James is wondering what, you know, Kennedy's like with on pot. I'm wondering what Kennedy was like on LSD if he did that. Right. It's like, dang. You know. 
But anyway, uh, that's it as far as my research goes. That's where it ends. If you, of course, anybody out there want to contribute, uh, know anything further about the unsolved... If you killed JFK's girlfriend, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) email us. At littlepodcasthorrors at (laughs) gmail.com. And then, of course, we will immediately forward that to the FBI. And 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 put in the subject, it was me... (laughs) <laughs> I killed JFK's girlfriend. That way we'll make sure to, to, to read it. Yeah, there you go. Because if it's anything else, we're just going to throw it in the trash. You know, <laughs> it's just, that's how it goes. So, you know. Anyway. Well, guys, thanks for joining us for episode... For episode 16. And we never heard from him again. <laughs> yeah, this is the last Sorry. time. Sorry. It's just like, yeah. My life, you know, it's like, guys, I'm doing a podcast. I feel like a kid. My mom's like, that's sweet. I need you to take out the garbage <laughs> once you're done. Okay, sweetheart. Okay, dear. Sure thing. And like my little boy's in here and he's just like, you yeah. know. But anyway. All right, guys. Well, thanks for joining us. And uh, as always, hail Ashtar and vibrate responsibly. Yeah, I did it. <laughs> I gotcha. <laughs>